our Baptist Church. I'm Cody Serber. We are so glad to have you to join us in worship this morning. Here are a few things that are happening on the hill. Grow teams will not meet again until further notice. Everyone is invited to our Happy Birthday Jesus Fellowship this Wednesday evening at 6.30 in the FLC. Bring your favorite finger food and join us in the celebration of the season. The story will be held at 7 p.m. this evening. The Children's Choir will present Sheep Stuff next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. We are planning a mission trip to Brazil on March 8th through 16th. An interest meeting will be held December 11th at 6.30 for anyone interested. We have a deacon election on January 7th to fill three positions as presented at the November business meeting. Nominations of any men who are willing to serve but not been ordained will be accepted through Sunday, December 17th. Finally, if you are visiting with us, please take a second to scan the QR code or fill out the guest card and stop by the welcome desk on your way out to pick up a free gift. That's what's happening on the Hill. Thanks for being here to worship with us. Excited that you're here. My name is Brother Rob Jones. If you're visiting with us, I serve as senior pastor here at Ingemar. And on behalf of all of us, I want to say welcome, and I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. So pray with me. Lord God, we come to you now, and we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, for your truth, and, and Lord, just your goodness. Lord God, I pray now as we go through this service, Lord, I pray that we would just pour it all out to you, Lord, bring, pour it all out to you, and that we would... Worship you, Lord, with truth and wisdom here this morning, and that, Father, you would bring a transformation in our hearts and in our minds. So, Father, be with us as we go through this worship service. Lord, we love you and we thank you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, this is Carson. This is Carson. Some of you know Carson. And uh, anyway, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Carson and I and his family, we sat down and they wanted to come and join the church. And so last week, if you were here, we presented them. Uh, to join the church. Uh, but anyway, through that conversation, uh, it, it, Carson explained that he had never been baptized. He'd made a profession uh, at a young age, but he had never been baptized, uh, taking that step of believer's baptism. And so that is what Carson is here to do this morning, is he is here to profess publicly to you uh, his faith in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, Carson, is it by your own profession that you believe Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life? You've repented of your sins, and you're trusting in Him. Yes, Amen. All right, brother, scoot forward just a little bit. All right. Anyway, bend your knees a little bit. Here we go. You ready? It is my privilege to baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good job, brother. God bless you. Well, it's a special time of year, you know, when we think about a lady who dedicated her entire life to share in Christ with those who had never heard of him. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is important for a lot of reasons, but it's important because it will touch the lives of lost people around the world. You're going to have an opportunity now as we play a little bit of O Come All You Faithful and we sing together in a few minutes. If you've already given your offering through Sunday school or through one of the plates, it will be counted properly. And if you'd like to come down now, Put your offering in one of these beautiful little white baskets and share that with the Foreign Mission Board, International Mission Board, so that they might reach others for Christ. We invite you to do that at this time. Let's stand together.
to just be ready to hear your word this morning. This time of year, there can be a thousand things going in a thousand different directions, but right now, this time is for you. Help us to be open and ready to hear your word. Daughter, just ask that you please just continue to bless this church, this community, and just be with Rob as he's about to get up here and just speak your word, dear Lord. Guide him behind your cross and just give him the words that we all need to hear to apply to our lives, to be bright lights for you. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us each and every single day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Bill, don't go anywhere. Uh oh, you know this was coming, did you? How's everybody doing this morning? Good. I should have said welcome to Israel instead of welcome to uh, Ingemar Baptist. Phil, come over here. He gets mad when I do st- we do stuff like this, but that's okay. Like I said last night, I outrank you, so you'll get over it. Come over here. Yes, boss. So look, guys, you know we're doing the story. We're doing, we're doing the, as you can see, we're producing the story. And uh, listen, Brother Phil, and I wish we could do this for all of you guys and everybody, especially the sound booth guys, the cast and the crew. Um, i try this without crying. Guys, it has been such a joy. It has been such a joy to work with you, Brother Phil. It's been such a joy to work with you and everybody else who's done such a tremendous job making the story happen. Phil, you have put in countless, countless hours, brother, and I, we're grateful for you. So look, before you thank me, this is Avery's idea to do this, okay? <laughs> Listen, we wanted to get you something to show that we appreciate oh, you wow. and we love you and how great of a job you've done. Uh, turn it around so they can see it. It's, uh, it's the cover. It, <laughs> We got everybody to sign it that worked and participated. So we love you, brother. You. I love you so much. You hey, too. one more night. If you hadn't seen it, you guys come out and be a part. It's a really such a, a joy. Uh, somebody said last night, a visitor, I don't know who he was, said, man, it's ho- that's like Hollywood. That's Hollywood. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so you guys come out and be a part. I love you, brother. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much, man. And uh, thanks, guys. All right, now let's turn in our Bibles. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. That's where we're going to be today. Hey, listen, we're going to take a little break from the book of James. I know we're walking through James, but we're going to get past Christmas, and then we'll pick up in the first of the new year uh, in James. So you should be in Acts, Acts chapter 22. That's where we're going to be this morning, Acts chapter 22, and it should come as no surprise to everybody, Ronnie, we, we've really had a lot of emphasis on the word story these last few weeks, the word story. Seems like that's all I've heard is story this, story that, posters, and we got videos out, and this is the story, that's the story, and, and, uh, and that's really been our emphasis is the story these last few weeks. Would you agree, choir? Would you? I feel like that's probably all y'all have heard, right? Amen. So. The story, the story. We've been talking about the story. But you know, think about that word, story. You know, there's, there's, there's such a significance behind the meaning of stories. You know, I, I think, buddy, I think back to around Thanksgiving time, we would sit around the table as a family, and, and uh, my family, specifically my dad's side, would sit around and tell stories of, uh, of all the stuff that had happened, the crazy things that had happened in the past, and I'm just assuming it was all true, you know, but, uh, but they would sit around and they would tell stories. And some of the greatest memories in my life, Colt, are sitting around, sitting around the table and listening to and telling stories. They had such an impact on my life. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? But here's the thing, is that if you are a Christian, meaning you, you are born again, you've been washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, you have a story as well. Did you know that? You have a story as well. And here's the truth, guys. God, if you have that story, He intends for you to use that story in order to bring glory to him. I think we see in Scripture, I think we see in Scripture where a man used his story. You know what his name is? The Apostle Paul. Everybody say, the Apostle Paul. We're going to do a character study one of these days. The Apostle Paul. You should be in Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. A lot of verses here today. Acts 22, verse starting in verse 1, going all the way to 21. So instead of reading all of this up front, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a little background, and then we're going to work our way through the text this morning, okay? So the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, he's been converted and he's there. He's 
uh, witnessing. He's, he's on his missionary journeys, and he's changing the world. The world's being turned upside down by the Apostle Paul and his, his companions there. And he finds himself back in Jerusalem. And Paul's there in Jerusalem, and he, he goes up uh, to the temple, the temple there in Jerusalem. And he'd been all in Asia now, okay? And remember when we talked about Thessalonians, when we were in Thessalonians on Sunday night, uh, when he was in Asia Minor, they said, that's that guy who has turned this world upside down. Remember? And, and he caused a big stink there in Asia Minor. So, so he's in t- Jerusalem. He goes up to the temple, and he's there for some time. And then, and then some Jews who happen to be there from Asia, they recognize him. They recognize him. And they say, that's that preacher Who's causing all this trouble? Like just like a preacher, right? Causing, come here, stirring stuff up, right? And they look, that's the preacher who's causing trouble. And so, what do they do? They they cause a big stink. I don't know if they had a business meeting or not, but it doesn't matter. They they cause a big stink, and and what do they do? They rush at Paul and they seize him and they drag him out of the temple. Can you picture this in your head now? Paul's there, he's in the temple, and all the people, hey, that's the guy, get him, right? And everybody just runs at him and gets him, and they grab him, and they drag him out of the temple, and there's this commotion going on here in Jerusalem. Well, you know, at this time, Jerusalem was occupied by the Romans, and they wanted to keep the peace, and so here they are, there's this big ruckus, this big commotion, and the Romans see this. And so these Roman soldiers led by this Roman commander, they go into the crowd and they break the crowd up and they say, oh, calm down, calm down. And they get a hold of Paul and they say, bind him in chains. So they bind Paul in chains and they begin to ask, who are you, man? Who is this guy? And the crowd's going wild. And, you know, and so the, the, the Roman commander says, take him back to the Roman barracks. So they get Paul, he's bound in chains, and they take him back to the barracks, and they bring him on the, on the front steps of the barracks, and they say, who are you, man? Who are you? And the Apostle Paul says, well, don't mind if I do. <laughs> he tells them his story. He tells them his story. And here in Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 22, we have an account of Paul telling these people, his story. Raise your hand if you think you've got that in your brain this morning. Can you picture that? Paul's standing there. He's bound in chains. Who are you, dude? And here are all these people. And he tells them his story. I want to ask you this question this morning. Do you have a story? Do you have a story? Look at the person beside you and say, do you have a story? Do you have a story? Four parts to the story that I want to show you this morning. Four parts, four things from Scripture. The first thing is the old you. Look at the person to your left and say, the old you. I love doing that because you look at the back of people's heads. I don't know why. It just (laughs) makes my week when I do that. The old you. The old you. Look with me at verse 3. Here we go. Well, let let me start in verse 1 so we get the whole thing. Brethren and fathers, so Paul's standing there, okay? Paul's standing there. He's on the steps of the Roman barracks, and they say, who is this dude? And the people are going nuts, berserk. They're trying to kill him. And he addresses the people, and he says this. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet, and he said. So now Paul says this. The first point is the old you. He says this, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of uh, Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you all are today. I persecuted this way, meaning Christians, to death, binding and putting both men and women into prison. Paul stands up there and he begins his testimony, his defense, his story by saying, listen, listen, I was a dude who was going out into the world and persecuting these Christians even to the point of death. I didn't discriminate against men or women. I was taking them and dragging them out and putting them into prison. Paul begins his story by explaining his old life. Think about the Apostle Paul for a moment. 
Think about Saul of Tarsus. Think about who he was before he met the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You don't have to turn there, but if you're taking notes, in Acts uh, chapter 7, right? You remember that guy? Stephen. You remember Stephen? The model deacon, buddy. The model deacon. Stephen. Being full of the Spirit, he stands up and he preaches the gospel and the Jews don't like it. And so what do they do? They take Stephen and they drag him out and they stone that man and they put him to death. He dies for the gospel. And the Bible tells us that when they did that, they, the men who were stoning them took their coats and they laid them at the feet of a young man. You know who that young man was? Paul. It says this in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says, but Saul, excuse me, and Saul approved of his execution, meaning Stephen, they, he approved of executing that deacon. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, it says this, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters Four letters, to the, syn to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul, ladies and gentlemen, was going from house to house and dragging people like you and I, Christians, out of their houses and bringing them in prison, bound in chains. Bringing them to prison, bound in chains. Paul... <laughs> was an entirely different man than he was here in Acts chapter 22. Raise your hand if you understand that. But you know, here's the thing, Miss Beverly, is that oftentimes we, 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 we think that in order to have a story, we got to have this backstory like the Apostle Paul. Like we've got to be persecuting people. We got to be murderers. We got to be serial killers. We got to be meth heads. We, we got to be uh, drug dealers and all these, these terrible things. We've got to be these things in order for us to have a testimony or a story. But the truth is, if you are bought with the blood of Jesus, there is an old you. There is an old you. I want you to see some things here in Scripture. So we have this idea, and Paul was. I mean, he was radically transformed, and we'll get to that in a moment. But there are some things I want you to see in Scripture about Paul in the context of his day that's not so much different than you and I. Look at this. Look at this. You should be in Acts chapter 22. You should be in Acts chapter 22. Three things about the old Paul that I want you to see. Number one, Paul was educated. Paul was educated. He was educated. Look at verse 3. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel. The apostle Paul was no dummy. He was a man that was educated under one of the great teachers in Israel. The apostle Paul was an educated man. Our Sunday school lessons, our seminary classes don't, don't hold water to the amount of education probably that the Apostle Paul had. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. The Apostle Paul was educated. Raise your hand if you have been to high school here today. Raise your hand. If you're a kid, raise your hand if you plan on going to high school, okay? Right? Look, we're educated people. We're educated people. Raise your hand if you've been to a Sunday school class before. That's, a, that's pretty normal, right? The Apostle Paul was the same way. He was educated. But yet, he had an old you. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? Number one, he was educated. Number two, he was zealous. Ooh, he was zealous. Say zealous. zealous. He was zealous. Look at verse three. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Paul says, Paul says, Paul says, I was zealous for the Lord. He was zealous for the Lord. I mean, the apostle Paul had spent his life 
dedicated to the study of the Scriptures. He was educated, and then he applied that in the way that he thought he should apply it. He was so zealous for the Lord that he was willing to kill whom he perceived as heretics for the Lord. I believe the Apostle Paul was more zealous for the ministry than anybody in this room here today before his conversion. The Apostle Paul was zealous for the Lord. But that was in his old self. How is that possible? You see, I believe you can be zealous for the Lord and be lost. I believe you can be zealous for the Lord and not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you couldn't, Jesus wouldn't say this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, Phil, we can be zealous and we can do the work of the ministry and we can still be in that old self. The Apostle Paul did. He was zealous for the Lord. He was educated. Number three, I'm going somewhere, okay, so bear with me. The Apostle Paul was simply normal. He was normal. You say, well, what do you mean he was normal? Look, look at verse three. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God. Look at this. You ready? Don't miss it. Just as you all are today. Just as you all are today. So Paul, he's standing there. He's standing there, Ronnie. He's on the, he's on the steps of the barracks, and he's saying, he's saying, I'm just like you all are today. Like every single one of you who are about to try to put me to death, I was just like you. The Apostle Paul, at the end of the day, was a normal dude. He was a normal guy. But yet, he had an old self. Where are you going with this, Brother Rob? This is where I'm going with this, is that you don't have to be persecuting and executing Christians. You don't have to be a meth head who is addicted to meth and, and, and selling drugs and then meet the Lord and then be radically transformed to have an old you. You know why? Because it is not your actions necessarily that make you the old you. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ or lack thereof that makes you the old you. You see, when you are the old you, yes, our actions are sinful and they condemn us. But, but you see, the, the difference is, is whether or not we have a relationship with Jesus Christ that makes you the old you. Now, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. You're saying, Brother Rob, it's been a long time ago. And I was real young. And I was real young when I was converted. Listen. I agree with you. I made a profession at a young age. I made a profession at, at a young age. Uh, uh, in my grandmother's living room. But you know the truth here is, is that regardless of how old I was when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, before that point, I was dead in my sins. The old me is the one who was here. So you're saying, you're saying, well, Brother Rob, I got saved at a young age and I, I, I wasn't old enough to, uh, you know, shoot up heroin and do dope and all this stuff. And then I came. Doesn't matter. Because in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of the Lord, we are all sinful and we are all condemned. And when we, when we come to a realization of our sin, we are condemned by our sin, and when before we get to the point of salvation or repentance and turning and trusting in Jesus Christ, we are our old selves. Does that make sense? The first thing I want you to see about the story that each and every one of us has is that we all have an old you if you are saved by the grace of God. Okay, Acts 22. I'm going somewhere, so, so bear with me, okay? Bear with me. Bear with me. 
Number one is the old you. The second thing I want you to see about Paul's story, Paul's story is the encounter. Say the encounter. The encounter. Look at verse 6 if you would. So Paul's there. He tells about his old you. He's standing on the barrack steps. And then he says this, But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, so he's on the way to Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go into Damascus. There you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. You know what happened, Hayden? The Apostle Paul met Jesus Christ. He had an encounter with the resurrected Lord. You see, the Apostle Paul, he's in his old self. Boy, he's zealous for the Lord. He's, he's out there. He's the model. I mean, he's the model Pharisee. Everybody, oh, Apostle Paul, you so great. Kill those Christians that way. They're crazy. Oh, we love you, the Apostle. You're our hero. And yeah, so he goes to the chief priest. He gets, some, he gets some papers, and he says, I'm going to Damascus. I'm going all the way to Damascus to go and get those Christians. And so he's on the road to Damascus from Jerusalem. He's on the road. It's about noontime, and he's... he's Ready to go get them. I mean, he's got his posse together to go get these Christians. And all of a sudden, boom, a bright light shines around him. He's blinded. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says what? I am Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. I just want to say this, that when people attack you, when people attack you, you know, you know they're really attacking Jesus. You realize that? You realize that? Jesus didn't say, I mean, Paul hadn't like drugged Jesus personally in the bodily form out and, into, and brought him in the streets. No, but he's, he's persecuting the Christians. And what's Jesus say? You're persecuting me. See, the Apostle Paul, he had an encounter with the risen Savior. I think about my own personal story, my personal testimony. I was a young man. And I've said this before, so if I sound like a broken record, just bear with me one more time. But I was a young man sitting in my grandmother's living room. Does anybody here remember Bible Man? Some of you probably have looked that up since I've said that. You guys know Bible Man. Yes, I love it. Okay. Bible Man. It was a cheesy 90s kid program. You know what I'm talking about? He had a lightsaber, and he would just chop these demons down and send them back to hell with his lightsaber, you know? The sword of truth or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And... and uh, Anyway, so I was sitting in my grandmother's living room watching uh, VHS. Y'all remember those VHS tapes of Bible Man? And, and for some reason, some of you are saying VHS tapes are new. All right, okay, I get it. Okay, but, but I was watching Bible Man. And you know what, Phil? I, I came under conviction of my sin. I realized watching that cheesy 90s kids program that if I died... I would go to hell because of my sins. And I told my grandma, I said, Grandma! <laughs> I said, Grandma, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> and she came. She shared the gospel with me, and I prayed to receive Christ. And you want to know what really happened in that moment? I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I had an encounter with the resurrected Lord of the universe. Even though I, the old me, I was a, 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 an innocent, seemingly innocent child. Even though the old me hadn't been out snorting, snorting cocaine or whatever. I still had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though I wasn't blinded. Even though uh, uh, I wasn't on the road to Damascus and somebody had to lead me by the hand into, into a city to meet a guy named Ananias, I still nevertheless met Jesus Christ. My question for you this morning is have you, have you, have you ever had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus? 
I mean, have you ever come under conviction of your sins and realized, I'm lost. This gospel applies to me and I need a resurrected Savior, someone to save me. And then you cry out to the Lord, Lord, save me. Repent of your sins and trust it in Him. Have you ever had that encounter with the Lord? I don't want to jump the gun here. I don't want to jump the gun here, but there have been a couple that have been saved these last couple of nights. You know, they encountered the Lord. They encountered the Lord. Look, I'm not one all about, <laughs> about feelings and, oh, let's just have this great, you know, spiritual experience. But I'm telling you, when you come under conviction and you cry out to the Lord, you encounter Him. And that is the gospel truth. Four things I want to show you this morning about the story. Number one, number one is the old you. Number two is the encounter. And number three, here we go, is the new you. Somebody say the new you. The new you. I like that. The new you. The new you. Look with me, verse 11. Here we go. You ready? But since I could not see, because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. So Paul's on the road to Damascus. Let's paint the picture, right? He's telling his story now. He says, there I was on the road to Damascus. I'm going to kill these Christians. And boom, I meet the Lord Jesus Christ. A bright light shines about me. I'm blinded. And then after he meets Jesus Christ, he says that I couldn't see, so some folks had to lead me into Damascus. Verse 12, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me standing near, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Verse 16, now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. What happens? The Apostle Paul is a different man. Saul of Tarsus is a different man. He's on the way to Damascus with one thing in mind, and you know what? He winds up in Damascus with something else on his mind. You see, he winds up, he starts off for Damascus going as one man, and he gets there as another. You see, I believe that the Apostle Paul experienced a tremendous transformation. You think about this now. You think about, think about this for a second. Tune in, tune in. If you've zoned out, tune back in. You think about this. One minute, here's this guy ravaging the church, killing them, zealous for the Lord to kill people for him. He gets to Damascus, and he goes on, and this man write, goes on to write more books than anybody else in the New Testament. How is that? Think about 1 Thessalonians. I mean, we just went through that whole study. And he goes into synagogues and preaching. And now people are beating him up. I mean, he's there. There's even an account in Scripture where he's stoned and left for dead. Some think he is dead. I might think he's dead. And, and, and here he is. He's one minute the one doing the killing. And the next minute, he's the one being killed. I don't know about you guys. I don't know about But that seems like a really radical transformation. A radical transformation took place after Paul had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I, here's the Marine story. I had to throw it in there somewhere. Okay. I went to boot camp. I told you I was kind of a fat kid when I went to boot camp. And uh, not kind, I was. So I got to boot camp. And I got there, and uh, like I said, I, I don't know, I was probably like, pushing 230 somewhere in there you know and I get to boot camp and and uh I was there for three months well 13 weeks 
Okay? There for about three months. And my, Adam, you can attest to this. When my family came to Paris Island, they didn't even recognize me. They didn't even recognize me. I see, I went like at 2.30, and in three months, I came back at like 170-something. In three months. You could take my skin and pull it, and it was like, you know, just like, like that movie Flubber. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Radically transformed. I was a little brainwashed, too, I think, Dylan. I mean, you know? <laughs> Different person. They didn't recognize me in a short amount of time. I was radically transformed. And so were all the other recruits and then Marines that I graduated from Paris Island with. I was radically transformed. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you have met Jesus Christ, if you have been born again, if you have been washed by His blood, listen to me, you too have been radically transformed. It is no longer you who lives, but it is now Christ who lives within you. The old you has passed away, and the new you is now Christ Jesus living within you. You are transformed. You are changed. Listen, you may not be perfect, but you're certainly going in that direction. You may not have it all figured out, but you're moving in that direction. You may not be totally transformed until you get to that side of eternity, but you heading in that direction, and you're certainly not where you were before you met Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible teaches that if you are bought with the blood, if you have the Spirit of God living within you, you will, you will, you will produce fruit. Ladies and gentlemen, I have never once seen a dead tomato plant produce a tomato. I have never once seen a watermelon plant produce a tomato. If you are a Christian, if you are bought with the blood, you will produce fruit fruit. You will be radically transformed. So I'm here to ask you this question now. Have you been transformed? Have you been transformed? Can you look at your life and say, I at one point was lost in my sins. I was dead. I was on my way to an eternity in hell. And now here I am by the grace of God, been radically transformed. And I'm on my way to an eternity with Jesus Christ. Can you say that today? Can you say that today? The Apostle Paul was a new man after he met Jesus. And you'll be a new you after you meet Jesus as well. Four things, four things. Number one is the old you. Number two is the encounter. Number three is the new you. And here we go. You ready? Number four, you're saying, well, I thought that was all there was. Well, hang on. We're almost done. Number four is the continuation. Say the continuation. The continuation. What do you mean by the continuation? Here's what I mean. Look at this. Look at verse 17, okay? So let, let me give you a little context here. I know I'm trying to beat this into your brain, and I know I sound like a broken record, but that's all right. So Paul, he's on the road to Damascus. He's his old self. He meets Jesus. He's transformed radically into this new man after meeting Jesus Christ. But you know, the, the Lord's not done with Paul right there. Well, that's a wrap. He got saved. That's the end of it. Good luck, Paul. Hope you have a great life. See you in heaven in a few years. No, okay? That is not how that played out. You see, I believe there was a continuation of God's purpose for Paul. Look, look, here we go. You ready? Verse 17. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. Paul falls into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, meaning Jesus, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. Paul's saying, 
Lord, I used to go to the synagogues and beat these people and persecute these people. (laughs) He's giving him an excuse. And he says this, and he says this, verse 20, And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I was standing by approving and watching out for their coats of those who were slaying him. He's saying, I, look, I was even there when they killed the great Stephen, the greatest deacon there. I, when they killed him, I was the one watching their coats so nobody would steal them. <laughs> look at what Jesus says. Verse 21, and he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul says, You can't use me, Jesus. I was just one guy out there killing these folks. I was just a guy that was, as they were, as they were killing your man, Stephen, I was holding their coats to make sure nobody stole them. You can't use me, Jesus. What did Jesus say? Go. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Where are you going with this, Brother Rob? You see, you see, I believe this, Avery, is that after we're saved, God still has a purpose and plan for our lives. Once we are transformed, you see, I believe that that God still has a continuation of his plan and purpose for our lives. Do you hate that? Do you hate hate, uh, that in movies when you see to be continued? Do you hate that? You know, you hate that. Some of you think about Wednesday night Bible study. uh, To be continued. I hate that, brother. uh, Right? You hate that. I hate that. I'm like, just finish the movie, right? But you know what? Our Christian life is the same way. You see, it's a continuation. You see, I believe when... The Lord saves us. He says, to be continued. You know, you don't stop there. You you have a purpose. You have a plan. I've left you on this earth to serve me, to witness for me, to bring my gospel to those who desperately need it for me. You see, when you become a Christian, your job ain't over. It is not enough. Yes, it's enough to be saved to come just as you are. But to live the Christian life is not enough for you to just say, well, that's a wrap. Time to go home. Back to living how I was and doing what I was doing. Didn't happen for Paul. And it won't happen to you. There is a continuation of God's plan and purpose for you. You know, I seem to remember reading this. Phil, help me out. I seem to remember reading this. Somewhere in Matthew, maybe Matthew chapter 28, Jesus left us a commission, something like that. And he said, uh, oh yeah, that's right. Go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you even always until the end of the age. That is five times in the scriptures. Jesus has commissioned us to do that. And ladies and gentlemen, when we get saved and we're radically transformed, our job is to make disciples. It is to grow closer to the Lord by making disciples. God has a plan and he has a purpose for you and for I and for Ingemar Baptist Church. And I don't know about you, but I plan to continue on doing so. So let me ask you that. Are you continuing with your story? Is God still writing your story? Is he still allowing you to shape and mold or are you still allowing him to shape and mold you into someone that he is using and, and, and wants to use and, and, and is building his kingdom? Are you allowing God to continue writing your story? Ladies and gentlemen, we all have a story. If you are saved by Jesus, you have a complete story. But we all have a story. Let me ask it this way. What part of the story are you on? What part of the story are you on in your life? Are you to the continuation part? Or are you still all the way back in point one, still in your old you? Let me say this. If you're, if you're in the continuation part, meaning... There's an old you, you've been transformed, and now there's the new you, and you are serving the Lord. Listen, the Lord wants to use your story. He wants to use your story to share Him with others, just like the Apostle Paul. So use it. 
But if you're here today and you are back here on point one, part one of the story, and you are still in the old you, you say, there is no marked difference. You say, yeah, I might have said some magic words. I didn't know what I meant. But there is no marked difference. There was no old me. There was no encounter with the Lord. And there is no new me. And you all the way back here, listen to me, start writing the story now. You know how you do that? You do it by trusting in Jesus Christ, by believing in Jesus Christ. Listen, the word belief in Jesus is a two-part word. You have to do two things in order to truly believe in Jesus. Number one, you got to turn from your sins. That word is called repentance. You have to repent of your sins. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I I realize that uh, I'm condemned to hell. And, And Lord, I'm turning from my sin. And when you turn from one thing, you have to turn to something else, and that someone else is Jesus Christ. And that's the second part to the word believe. That is trusting in Jesus. Like you would trust a parachute, like you would trust a bridge, like you would trust a seatbelt, Avery, to catch you in a car crash. You are trusting in Jesus to save you. You say, Jesus, I can't do it myself. I am trusting in you and in you alone to save me. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you have an encounter with the Lord. If you have not had an encounter with the Lord, you still all the way back here in part one. Let the Lord start writing your story today. You see, the other thing is this, is we don't know when our story can end. It could end at any moment. I mean, somebody could hit the stop, the Lord could hit the stop button. No matter where you're at, you say, well, I'll do it next week. Well, there may not be a next week. The end of the tape could end today. It could, and I'm not trying to scare you, but it is the truth, guys. I could pull out of here and get hit by a semi-truck, and that is the end of Brother Rob. You guys would eat chicken and form a search committee, and that would be it. (laughs) It's the truth. It would be the end of the story. But the truth is this, is that you don't know when your story is going to end either. So go on. Complete the story. Have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Cry out to Him, Lord, save me! Because I can't do it myself. My prayer for you this morning is that if you've not had an encounter with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, like the Apostle Paul has, you won't walk out of these doors without doing that. I'm here to pray with you. Avery's going to be here to pray with you. we got a lot of people that will pray with you and help you have that story, to begin that story. Listen, don't walk out without doing that. If you're here today and you have got a completed story, go out there and share it with somebody. Go out there and tell something. There's a lost world that is still on part one of their story. Go out there and help them kickstart their story so that Jesus Christ will come into their life and save them and radically transform them as well. Whatever God Almighty is leading you to do this morning, don't you walk out of these doors without doing that. I'm going to pray. Father, we come to you now, Lord, and we thank you so much. For your great blessings, for your great mercy, and Lord, for <laughs> Lord helping me to <laughs> write my story, God. Lord, for really for you writing my story. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for the encounter that I had with you. And thank you for radically transforming me and changing me. Lord, while I'm not perfect and I've got a long way to go, and you know that, Father God, I thank you for the transformation that is happening in my life. Lord, I pray now for those who are here. I pray that God, if there be some here that need to be radically changed and transformed, Lord God, let them just encounter you this morning. Let them come to you with all humility and submission. Cry out to you, Lord, save me. Because I can't do it myself. Lord, for those who are here today who have been transformed, who who are bought with the blood of Jesus, Lord, help us to go out and to share our story, which is really part of your big story. 
with a world who is lost. Help us to be a people that are focused on the gospel above all things else. Lord God, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here to worship with us online. If you'd like to make a decision today, call the number that's on your screen. We have counselors that are standing by that would love to help. If you're calling after our live services, leave us a message and some contact information and we'll get back with you. Thanks once again for being here to worship with us. I hope to see you soon in person and God bless.